Oh, it's good to be together. I love worship. Thank you, people, that you take it on and you let us linger in the presence of God and just allow our hearts to just soak in the blessing of God. He's so good to us, isn't he? Yes. Amazing. What an amazing God. Yes. Hallelujah. If you'd like to turn to um, Isaiah 61 right now, we'll just have a quick look at that and just see where we go with this today. We want to pray for people again. At the end of the service, I believe that God wants to just minister to us and encourage us and to just release us as that prophetic word came there just a minute ago that we just look to God's report. You know, we all hear the news and we hear the, um, the stories and the negativity, as Lynn said, and so on. And, you know, we get clo clo coated, you know, we get coated. Our hearts and souls get coated sometimes with blah. And it's good to come into the presence of the Lord like this and worship and seek his face and, and look to him and just get a, a hose down. How many of you feel hosed down sometimes in the presence of God? It's a good thing. I love it. I feel washed and clean. And Hallelujah. Isaiah 61, Father, we thank you so much for what you do to us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. It's a cleansing. It's a deep cleansing. It's a rich cleansing. It's a cleansing that's like no other. It's inside and out. And we thank you for the washing of the water of the word that cleanses us and releases and refreshes us. We thank you for the anointing that comes down from heaven that refreshes and renews us. We thank you for the environment of your presence. We thank you that in this place, your presence dwells. You love being here. It's your delight to be here. It's your passion to, to beautify your bride. And you are working diligently, 24-7, Lord, to make us beautiful. Hallelujah. We just receive your oil of blessing today as we look into your word. Come, Holy Spirit. Just keep coming on us. Keep coming on us. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim cap freedom to the captives and release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, verse... Uh, the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion. Where are they grieving? Zion. In Zion. Yes. That Zion is the, the um, place or the presence of God in Jerusalem at that time, but it's a representation for you who don't know that it's the church. It's just a, re the, a representation projecting into the place of the church in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. And there are people who grieve in Zion uh, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. And they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planning of the Lord for the, for the display of his splendor. For the display of his splendor. Say that, for the display. Of his splendor. I mean, God is just amazingly working in us passionately, consistently, unabated, and forever, un, you know, not phased one scrap about what we're like. He is working for the display of his splendor, and we are that display to the whole world and to all nations, to all cults, groups, religious. Uh, bent or whatever else, ideologies and cir circumstances, the church is to rise up as a display of splendor in the earth because there's nothing else in the earth that can save the planet except Christ in the church. Amen. You're all alive out there. Well, I just want to mention today, this is my message is the penetrating oil of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit penetrates. It's the WD-40 of heaven. Hello. The W, and sometimes we need to get unstuck. How many of you know that? We get stuck in a rut. We get a little bit rusted with religion. Are you listening to me? Religion is a rust bucket. It's a rusting agent. And the relationship with the living Christ in intimacy and, and, and the flow of his love 
penetrates us with his oil. And it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me for something. You know, the anointing comes on us to touch people's lives. The spirit of God is in us, for us, and on us, for them. Hallelujah. And we can just have it for us and, and sit in that and enjoy that or soak in that. But you've got to watch out for the sitting and the soaking because it could end up in souring if we don't give it away, if we don't use it to bless someone else, if we don't bless others, if we don't touch their lives. And I just want to major on the point because I felt the Holy Spirit emphasize the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Sometimes we're grieving over situations and we, we have a right to. We have a right to grieve when someone dies. The scripture just says don't grieve like the, he the heathen do. Ever seen the heathen grieve? It's a sad story. It's, it's ugly. But we don't grieve in that way. We have a grief because we've lost someone. Someone's been wrenched from the depth of our heart, torn away. It's, it's an, a mysterious experience in that situation. And you have a right to grieve. But it says the oil of joy for the grieving. And there's issues like uh, grieving, mourning, uh, ashes, mourning again a second time, spirit of despair. Sometimes we can feel like our dreams and life's ambition is in ashes because certain things happen and it took a different tack and it went not the way we thought and we can end up feeling like we're lost, we're missing something, but God wants to penetrate us with the oil of his gladness, the oil of joy. And, and I believe it's penetrating to the core of our being. We're just going to look at a couple of things on this. You know, Hebrew, um, what I yes, the oil of joy. And in Hebrews 1.9, it talks about Jesus, that God anointed Jesus above his fellows, filling him with the oil of joy. The evidence that he was in another bracket was the oil of joy. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. That sounds good. God wants to lubricate our hearts, soften our hearts with oil, penetrate us, soak us, saturate us. The oil of the Holy Spirit is not a little thing. With God, a little dab won't do you. All you oldies, you rockers, back in the 50s, brill cream, a little dab will do you. Elvis Presley slicked up with brill cream. Well, in the kingdom of God, a little dab won't do you. It's an overflow. It's a flood. It's a pouring out. It's an anointing. That, it's a distinguishing issue. It's a distinguishing difference between us and the world. Psalm 109, let's just have a look at this. This is a negative scripture for you, but I'm going to turn it into a really good one. I manipulate the truth. Be careful here. Don't watch this guy, you know. It says here, it talks about the wicked man, and it says, He loved to pronounce a curse. May it come on him. He found no pleasure in blessing, may it be far from him. He wore cursing as a garment. It entered into his body like water and into his bones like oil. Wow, that's pretty heavy. The wicked can be, and you could probably think of certain people in the world or historical uh, country leaders that you could think they were wicked. And the sense is here is that they loved it. They loved to pronounce a curse. And, may it, and it says, may it come on him, may it be found. He, he found no pleasure in blessing, may it be far from him. He wore cursing as a garment. He was wrapped in something that they loved to do, evil. And it entered his body like water into his bones like oil. Now I'm going to change that scripture. I'm going to reverse it. You see, if you um, live in a place of condemnating others, damning others, bitterness towards others, condemnation, I mean, um, it can enter into you and it gets a hold of you. It can get a grip on you and it's in you and it can grip you and possess you and dominate your life.
lifestyle and your landscape and everything you see becomes something that follows that way because it enters into you. And there's only one way out. It's a change of mind and heart to repent of that attitude and accept the fact that God calls us to bless. He calls us to bless. And uh, so we say here, if I reverse this, verse 17, he loved to pronounce a blessing. May it come on him. He loved to pronounce a blessing. May it come on him. I believe the church must learn to love to enter into the rich blessing and secret, uh, the secret of blessing. Passing on a blessing. Giving a blessing away when they don't deserve it. When people curse you, he says, bless and curse not. Jesus said that. That means we can. We can curse. But we also, by the power of the love of God, turn around and bless in light of that thing. If you want to cancel a curse, just pass on a blessing. That's the point. So he says, he pronounced a blessing. May it come on him. He found great pleasure in blessing. Uh, and it was close to him. He wore blessing as his garment. He wore blessing as his garment, and it entered into his body like water and into his bones like oil. Hello. If you love to bless, if you adopt the spirit of the heart of God in blessing others in spite of what they do for you, it will penetrate you. It will enter you. It will go deep to the core of your being, and it will change the culture of your thinking in your heart. Oh, come on. If you love to bless, because God loves to bless. He loves to bless us in spite of us. I'm amazed. I've gone through scriptures and written stuff down about how God just overlooks the foolishness of our own heart and pours out a blessing. He blesses and he wins us by his blessing. You know, the oil that came on the priest in Psalm 133 was a lot of oil. It went down on his head upon the, the mitre he had on the collar of his skirts. It was a lot of oil poured on that guy when he was anointed. David was anointed with a horn of oil, a horn, a ram's horn. You know, the king that the people chose, Samuel anointed him with a man-made vial of oil. But the man God chose was a ram's horn of a sacrificed animal. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Write that down. That's right. And it was a horn. dumped it on him. David was anointed with oil from a horn of oil by Samuel, and it says from that day on, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him for the rest of his life. He was saturated in oil. Turn over to two kings for saturation there. It was about um, Elisha and Elijah. <coughs> Where is two kings? After one kings, okay. Thanks very much. Look, I'm in Samuel and I keep skipping the Chronicles. There it is. What? Oh, thanks. Phew. Hey, listen, can I have a... Is one of these mine? Hallelujah. Now that entered into me like water. I felt it. Two kings. I'm still not there. Okay, now this is a great story you should read if you don't know anything about this. Elijah was a great prophet, and Elisha was the guy that served him. And he, uh, you know, he, he, his job description was, I wash the hands of my master. What's your job, Elijah? I wash the hands of my master. He served him. He did nothing else but just serve. He was happy to wash the hands of his master. He was not looking for position. Yet he was under the mentoring of Elijah. And Elijah was passing on a lot. He was his companion all the time. And Elisha drew from him. And now was the time for him to be taken up to heaven. God was taking Elijah away. And they got through this whole process of going here, there, and everywhere that has good meaning and stuff. And it says there in verse 9, oh, I thought you were the prophets. <laughs> Prophetic people know ahead of time. I don't even know where I am. I thought, chapter 2, verse 9, it took me long enough to find two kings. 
When, when, they crossed, when they crossed the Jordan, it was, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken up. And Elisha said, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Verse 10, Elijah says, you have asked a difficult thing, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Well, Elisha was not going to take his eyes off the boss. <laughs> he said, I want a double portion. And that may not mean twice as much as what Elisha, Elijah had. It can just mean the full empowering an endowment that he had on his life. There is different things here. In the New Testament, the, this, the eldest son, or the Old Testament, New Testament, the eldest son inherited a double portion of the inheritance of the father, even if he had 10 brothers and sisters. It did not mean he got twice as much as the rest. It meant the point was that he got more as the one who would take the, the leadership of the household and when his brothers and sisters ever got into debt or issues, he had the resources to help them. Hallelujah. It wasn't just a self-gain thing. It was for someone else. The anointing on us is for someone else. And he was looking for a double portion that would expand. Now, people said that Elisha did nearly twice as many miracles as Elijah, thinking it's a double portion. And, and here, let's say... Uh, it says in verse uh, 12, it says, Elisha saw this, he saw the whirlwind, he saw the fire, he saw the chariots come from heaven, big light power and show, wonder thing. And it says, he saw him go and he said, he cried, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel, and Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart, and he picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen on from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and the left and he crossed over. And the company of the prophets who were watching all this from a distance said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. What a pretty dramatic sort of thing. Yeah, pretty full on actually. And that anointing raised Elisha up into a whole new ministry and function, and they say possibly twice as many. Well, I don't think it's actually twice as many, but nearly twice as many. If they say they were actually twice as many, nearly twice as many of those miracles were done while he was alive. The last miracle he did was when he was dead. How many have you ever read that? I think this is interesting. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. It, it's, you know, there's some, it's amazing what God puts in Scripture. Like last week, Pastor Terry shared about Jabez. You've got this whole thing in Chronicles of the names of the fathers and the son who begat so and so and how many tribes and it's boring. It's absolutely boring. Then suddenly, the name Jabez is mentioned and two verses are identified him and then they go back into the boring genealogies. <laughs> and you get a good message. Well, here's another one with two verses in the whole Bible about this whole scene that really has a lot of impact. <laughs> Verse 14, chapter 2 Kings 13, 14. Now, Elisha was suffering from an illness from which he died. Then there's this little story, and it goes, we won't worry about that. Verse 20 now, Elijah died and was buried. Now, oh, sorry, whatever, Elisha. He was so like Elijah, he almost sounded the same. Now, it says Elijah died. Elisha died. Now, look at this. Just take note of this little bit here. This really tickles my fancy. Now, Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. It's like they, you know, woke up after a long winter, boring in the house, you know, goes down to the bathroom, you know, washes his face, and there's a calendar there, and he looks at the calendar. First of April, Northern Hemisphere. Oh, great! It's spring! Hallelujah! And what's it say? 
the Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Think, oh, excellent. Time to search up a few Jews. <laughs> they made raids every spring into Israel's territory to raid their property and their plunder, their uh, wheat and harvest, barley harvest and everything under the sun. They went in. They said, beauty, time to get together with the mates. Polish the sword, polish the armor, polish everything. It's spring. Time to get down and whatever. Now, it wouldn't have happened if Israel was walking with God. They couldn't do that. But they were having such fun for so many years, fun in their context, that because Israel's backslidden state, the door was open. The sin gave access to the enemy. And there's a great scripture, I think Deborah says it in Judges. She says, when Israel turned away from the Lord, war came to the city gates. I like these little scriptures. They really, really think, oh, wow, that's pretty full on stuff. When Israel turned away from the law, war came to them. You see, it wasn't so much God judging them, but because they opened the door, turned away from his protection, the enemy said, oh gosh, the gate's open. Let's go in. You see that? Anyway, extra for nothing. Once, while the Israelites were bearing a man, Suddenly, they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood on his feet. <laughs> now, this is hilarious. I mean, I don't want to be sanctimonious or anything because of, this is a solemn situation. But you can see the Moabites all get, got together, you know, I can see them like in the, in the dressing room in the football group and they're all ready to go out in the field and they're in a huddle, you know, and they're backstabbing one another and they're hugging each other and pumping each other up. Says, guys, we're off into, you know, Israel to get some stuff. We're going to plunder. We're going to do all this stuff. Isn't it exciting? And, they go, and they're on the road. They're on the road down to whatever Jewish village is first up on the agenda. So they're coming down the road. Now, coming down the same road, is a mournful ceremony of a guy that's died. And they're walking along that road, and then they see the, this band of Moabites going, coming. And they check their watches and think, oh, 1st of April, it's spring, I forgot. Should have done this yesterday. <laughs> Forgive my kinky imagination, but I love it. And, and they're walking solemnly down the road towards the area of the tombs, which could be caves, could be uh, holes cut in the wall with stones in front of them and stuff like that. And they see the Moabites coming. <laughs> and so they stop all the parading and the mourning and the ceremony and everything, and they take this guy and chuck him into the nearest open place. He's flying through the air, and he lands on Elisha. He touches Elisha's bones, and from going from a dead place, flying through the air, not knowing anything, I understand medically there's a lot wrong with a dead person. <laughs> I've been told. Is that right? I mean, he's not thinking of anything. He's not thinking, oh, this is a nice ceremony, how much they love him. He's not thinking when he's flying through the air, what's happening to me now? He's dead. But he hits Elisha's bones because the anointing had penetrated his bones. The impact, the miracle. <laughs> Don't worry, mate, I'm, on, I'm fired. He touches his bones because the anointed penetrated to the core of Elisha's being. And that's what God's trying to say to us. He wants us not to be shallow or a little day will do you, but to have such an anointing that when it's the right time, it doesn't mean you go out to the hospital and you pray for all the sick or anything, but God will give you a moment and a time in your life where he'll anoint you or something will trigger. He won't anoint you. He'll just, he'll just speak or say, this is the time. Pray for that person and something will happen. And it'll come out of the depth 
It'll come out of the depth. And when it comes out of the core of your being, out of that reservoir that God has deposited in there, you'll be shocked and surprised at what happens. You'll say, they'll say, man, you prayed for me and I got healed. And you go, what? Really? (laughs) You'll be shocked because that anointing penetrates to the core of your being. And so this guy hits his bones and he comes to life. Now, I, I, sorry about this, but this guy comes to life. Now, they didn't embalm him. They didn't embalm him like the Egyptians. They, did, they brought a lot of things from Egypt, but they didn't bring embalming. They wrapped him in sheets tucked in all over the place or strips of cloth and a face cover and maybe their jaw held up. So this guy goes, boom! Um, now his mates, they're heading back down the road. They're running down the road because this other bunch, the Moabites, are coming. <laughs> and he's, you know, it says bound hand and foot, but he could, you know, walk a bit like this. It reminds me of the iNet guy on TV that's all wrapped up in strings. He's all, yeah, how many of you know that ad on TV where he's all wrapped up and he, he's sort of like this and he's got a remote in his hand? And he goes, and all the stuff falls down, all the ropes down around his legs, and he throws the remote down, smoke comes up. You can see I don't take any notice of ads much. And then the guy goes, and he's said all he's said about INET, he goes, I can just picture this guy. He doesn't know what's happening. He's just standing there alive. (laughs) And so he sees the opening of the cave, and he sees his mates clearing out, and he goes, He's, I mean, his jaw's tied up. <laughs> fellas, fellas, mates, hey. And he gets out to the opening of the cave and he's looking down the road and says, guys, guys. And they're running away. Now they hear him and he look, they look, turn around and look at him and go, ah! And they turn off and they run faster than they did before because there's the ghost or his mates, there's the Moabites behind him and they're thinking, this is crazy, let's get out of here. And so they're running like mad and so he's standing there going, fellas, fellas, I don't know what's going on. Why is this like this? And then he goes, why are you running away? And he thinks, oh, oh, oh no, it's the first of spring. There's some mama voice. And he doesn't know what to do. And he thinks, I can't go anywhere. Maybe I should go back into the tomb. (laughs) Anyway, the Moabites come along and they come up to him. (laughs) And they're charging down thinking that, Oh, so there's some Israelites. Let's get them. And they come up to this guy. It's a, it's a body standing on the side of the road, wrapped up. Hello, you don't meet that every kind of every day of the week. <laughs> and the whole army stops. And other guys are looking at other guys and says, are you seeing what I'm seeing? There's a tomb behind and there's a body standing here all wrapped up. And they go, ah! And they turn around and go back to Moab. (laughs) The other friends go, they're going back to their village. They're going back home because they've seen a ghost. And this guy's still standing there and there's nothing in Scripture that says what happens next. (laughs) The poor guy. I'm hot. Now, (laughs) there is a point to all this. But you know what? I think God has to show himself to us in different ways sometimes to say, will you lighten up, church? (laughs) Will you lighten up? Why is this so heavy and so hard? Oh, dear. Come on. (laughs) He wants to touch us with the oil of gladness. Now, I'm giving a bit of a comedy sketch because God gave it to me. 
I'm blaming him, folks. And I shared this message in, in Kyogle. I shared it at four churches around the country of Papua New Guinea, and it lightened everybody up. <laughs> the point is, I think, you know, Bob Mumford used to say, he makes the, the, the people laugh because that opens up their rib cage, and it makes it easier to put the spear of truth in. <laughs> oh, okay, that's the end of the message. I feel like we should finish. <laughs> but look, isn't that brilliant? I, I mean, it's a funny statement to make. Two verses that just talk about that. The point is that the oil penetrated Elisha's bones. God has got a lot of oil pouring out. And we have this idea because we do use an anointing and, and we dab it on you as symbolic. But you know the pastors who took over us in Kyogre, they said, can you get a jar of oil and pour it over us? I thought, oh dear. I don't know how that would go for the rest of the day, walking around with that. So I ended up getting a bowl of oil and sticking my hands in it so it was dripping and I just anointed them on the head. It was good. So I didn't make a big mess. But in these scriptures, it was an anointing that penetrated, that soaked, that, that um, you know, we, <clears throat> oh boy, hallelujah. <laughs> we had, we're in New Island, and um, Arlene, you might have been there, I don't know, at the time. They were there for missionaries for years, and Joan and I were there for nine months, and um, Hans van der Waal had got this outboard motor, because I used I ride on the beach there, and they had ministry and stuff, and they're going to use it for out, reaching out. And but they, they they got it, but the piston was seized in the um, cylinder wall. And they tried everything to get that thing out. They had a block of wood, and they had a hammer trying to loosen it. It was just caked. It was just encrusted inside there. And they used oil. They used petrol. They used heaps of stuff. I don't know if they had WD-40 at the time. They may have had. But they could not shift the piston out of the wall until they went to a, a garage. Now, can anyone tell me what would have shifted that? Diesel. And the a mechanic said, just soak it in diesel all night. Fill up the cavity with diesel. And they did, left it overnight, it was soaking, and all that time the diesel fuel was penetrating the encrusted stuff that was in there holding it. In the morning they got that block of wood and a hammer went bang, push, straight out. It loosened it completely, it, it, it penetrated through the stuff. Now I want to say that with grieving or mourning or things to do with ashes or the barnacles of religion, you know, Joan and I lament the fact that as we get older, we seem to end up with a few more barnacles on us than we ever had before. Well, why is that? I mean, I've got this little mole here and that thing there, and nothing's cut out yet. But the thing is, we can let our Christian lives be encrusted, like a ship sitting in the water forever, not being moved, and it ends up with barnacles all over it. And I believe that God wants us to be in a place where we're lubricated with the Holy Spirit, where the engine is turning over, where the life flow is flowing, where our relationship with God is good and with one another. And we don't let our lives be encrusted by issues of bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness or walking in a sense of a lack of self-worth or a loss of worth or a sense of continual mourning over our state and saying, oh, I'm no good, I'm this, I'm that. All we, get, all we get out of that is an incrustation on us. And God wants to pour out his spirit of grace on us continually. It's not a little dab will do you. <laughs> you know, I believe in my heart today that God, is, well, in doing this message, you know, because it is a bit funny and a bit com a bit of comedy in it, you can get lost in that. And when you walk away today, don't say, oh, if you think it was funny. Um, don't say, what a funny message, and forget the point. <laughs> oh, the point is that I felt that like God was saying to me, there are people who are battling with issues such as mourning or grief. It could be having grievances. And those who feel like their dreams or plans are in a pile of ashes of some degree 
We're looking for the Lord to just anoint us with the oil of gladness. I love laughing. And it loosens you up, it lightens you up, it takes less muscles to, to, to smile and to laugh than a tw- t- hundreds of others to frown in your face. I mean, that's taking more muscles than... Hey, it's cool. Hallelujah. How many of you looked to God this morning just to... You know, I believe that in the comedy, God actually opens us up and he helps us to respond. And that right now, I'm just asking the Holy Spirit to come on us. I didn't come here just to do a message for Sunday morning because it's Sunday morning church. We want the word of the Lord that touches us, penetrates us. Now, I will say there's a couple of words of knowledge I felt God give me. And because we're talking about bones, I had this word about bone shavings or flakings in the body, if that's a thing. I don't know whether it is or not. Last time I was up here, I I had a word of knowledge. I had a couple of words of knowledge. I had about adhesions. And one other word of knowledge that I actually forgot, which I didn't take seriously, was God put cold shoulder in my mind. And I thought, cold shoulder? What is that? I mean, is there a bunch of people here giving other people the cold shoulder or what? You know? And I didn't take it seriously. And someone came up for prayer and they said they had a problem with their shoulder and it was like a chill in the shoulder. I thought, okay, God, I'm learning. <laughs> But there was one night before that, this was a while ago, where I was in bed and sometimes you get a pain, which is a word of knowledge, it's not yours, and I got this shot of pain in the left eye. And I went, whoa, I was in bed and I put my head into the pillow thinking, what is that? And later on I realised, well, it could have been a word of knowledge, but I didn't recognise it as that. So if someone has a problem with a left eye issue of some sort, whether you've had a needle go in because of an operation or some, something, I don't know, but I'm just saying this. The bone issue, you know, can come down to joints and ligaments and cartilage, damage, all kinds of stuff. I'd like to just pray for people like that. And I had a dream yesterday morning, and I was standing here, and I was preaching, and suddenly I stumbled this way like that, and it was about vertigo or dizziness. Okay, so if anyone identifies with some things like that, even the bone marrow, I think, Karina, is that where the blood is manufactured? Yes. So even blood situations, if people need that. Need that. But let's all stand right now. And um, let's just wait on the Holy Spirit. I don't know if the musicians can come up and play a, an instrument or something, just give us a bit of music. It doesn't have to be a song. But just play for us and... Hallelujah. How many are glad you're here this morning? (laughs) Oh, I love God. He's so good. He never has a dull moment, you know. Never has a bad hair day. He's never disgusted and appalled at us. He just loves us with an incredible, insatiable, everlasting love. And we just want to respond to him right now. So let's open up our hearts. See what he wants to do. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> There's a, a song that came to me, which we don't sing, but it's from the earlier days. It says, anoint me with fresh oil. Fill me, Spirit of God. It's repeated. Let me see your purpose, understand your ways. I want to get closer, Lord, so much closer, Lord, to you. Anoint me with fresh oil. So, Father, we just say this morning, this is your business. It's not mine. This is what you want to do. This is what you do best. We just open up right now. Just lift up your hands, even halfway or something. Be relaxed. I don't want you to stress, strive, or be anxious. Let your heart just rest and relax. Just rest. 
Baba Siboru Katakaramana. We wait upon you, Lord. We wait upon you, Lord. We just soak in your presence, God. Soak us right now. Penetrate us right now. If you want to speak in tongues, do so. The Bible says it's the rest of God. It's a rest. It's not a striving. It's not using it as a talisman or a magic thing. It's love. It's God's love language. If you've never spoken in tongues, just, just let the Holy Spirit just come on you right now. Lubricate your lips. Lubricate your tongue. Lubricate your brain. Lord, we just ask for that right now, for brain issues right now, reasoning issues. Turmoil in the mind, I just say now, Holy Spirit, come and lubricate. Lubricate minds right now. I feel the Holy Spirit's just targeting this where there's confusion, where there's torment, where there's uncertainty, where there's double-mindedness. We say, Holy Spirit, just come and lubricate our minds in Jesus' name. Sweet Holy Spirit, come. Just let your heart flow in the Holy Spirit right now. Don't get turned off or bored or whatever. Just, Just... Quieten your heart and enter in as ever you feel you can. Sweet Spirit come, sweet Spirit's presence. Oh, spray the WD-40 of heaven on our hearts right now, Lord. Any seized up hearts, hearts that are seized with lack of self-worth or feeling invaluable or a waste of time or a waste of space, Father God, I pray over all those that may feel like they're constantly down and oppressed. Lord, a spirit of despair right now, we break that in Jesus' Name. Put your WD-40 on that, Lord God. Come, Holy Spirit, anoint, anoint, anoint. Let joy break out. We say, Lord, specifically, let the oil of joy, the oil of joy that set Jesus as a class above His fellows because He was anointed with the oil of joy. We say, let your oil of joy break out. Lord, we can laugh at funny things, but your oil lasts forever. And your oil is a lubricating, liberating factor that causes us to laugh, that causes us to be joyful, that causes us to be blessed and can sit down relaxed in the blessing. We are a people of blessing. We wrap ourselves in a garment of blessing. We love to bless. And as we bless, Lord, it enters us like oil into our bones. Father, I just challenge you as we're just standing here right now, if there's anyone who has a battle with cursing, damning others, criticizing, roots of resentment that makes your mouth say stuff that you shouldn't be saying, Just right now, let the WD-40 of the Holy Spirit come onto that area of your life. And you yourself say, God, I've got a problem with this. I've got a battle here. I've got anger. I've got issues that cause me to just blurt out ugly stuff. I, I just ask your forgiveness, Father. Release me now. Heal me now with the blood of Jesus. Wash me in the blood and anoint me with the oil. Holy Spirit, come. Oil of joy for, gla- for morning. Oil of joy for morning. Oil of joy for morning. Come. Oh, yeah. Smear us with oil, Lord. Smear us with oil. Oh, I just believe God is just with His own hands, dripping with oil. Because the Bible says in the New Testament, anoint with oil means to smear. And so His hands, just can you picture... These hands dripping in golden oil right now, and they're coming to you on your head. He's putting his hands on your head, and he's running it down your face, down through your eyes, down through your face and behind your neck. 
And that oil doesn't just wear off his hands onto you. It just constantly fills his hands and constantly coming down over every area of being, whatever area of sickness, whatever area of confusion, whatever area you're battling in, the oil of gladness. We speak it, Lord. We speak it, Lord. We speak the oil of joy in Jesus' name. We receive it and we just drink it up. Oh, hallelujah. Your anointing oil, Lord. Karabasida barusha kasanda. Kida bakaranda masanda. Touch of God right now. There's a touch of God in different places here right now. Holy Spirit, come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Right now, in Jesus' name, just different ones throughout the congregation. There's a touch. There's a, a special touch. It's a release right now. Let it come. Let it come in Jesus' name. And it says the anointing breaks the yoke. So right now I just say in Jesus' name, every yoke, every bondage, every habitual ha uh, issue, every addiction or every problem of sin that's having a hard time breaking, penetrate now by the anointing. The anointing breaks the yoke in Jesus' name. The anointing breaks the yoke. Hallelujah. Release in Jesus' name. Oh, Father, we just thank you for your hand on us right now. We just say as we close this time, Father God, that we'll walk out smeared with oil, covered in oil. Oh, not a little dab, Lord, but smeared with a, a lot of oil, a horn of oil right now that penetrates to the bones. The Word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Come to the very marrow of our being, Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, if anyone wants prayer in any of these areas, anything to do with this message, where you feel like you need a loosening up and there's been a clogging up, and you want further prayer, come out here. If there's anyone suffering vertigo or dizziness, if there's someone here with some eye problem, it doesn't have to be a sharp pain, it can be an eye problem. It was my left eye, but we'll just leave it at that. And uh, anything to do with bone issues, bone matter, osteoporosis. That's a big one to pray for, but I'm just doing what I feel God says to do. Hallelujah. Just just, and we just close the service. If you want to sit there and soak in oil, just get a double dose. Get a double portion of WD-40 from heaven. Just enjoy it. Don't rush away. But if you want to go and have a cup of coffee, I'm not worried. The Holy Spirit is never disturbed by anything that happens. He's not going to say, oh, be quiet, sit down, you know. Holy Spirit's here and he needs ministry time. He doesn't need anything. He just needs to be asked and invited. So we bless you. We bless you as you go today. And if you want to stay for a cup of coffee, if there's visitors, there's a table up the back there. We'd love you to go and in, sit down at it and someone will come up and enjoy, uh, meet you and host you and share with you and talk with you, get to know you. But be free. Be free now just to um, enjoy one another's fellowship. Rub oil on one another. Amen? Amen. Come on. We're just going to continue to minister down the front here. And if all the pastors, leaders, elders uh, want to come forward and just pray for people, just lay hands on them. Lord, we just see our 